Hi everyone, in this video we're going to tackle the Phillips curve, specifically just the short run Phillips curve. Um, before I get started, let me explain what the Phillips curve is useful for in your course. Now, what the Phillips curve tells us is something that we already know, something we've already learned uh, using basic models to show inflation, demand pull or cost push inflation, but also to show long term equilibrium using the classical model. Um, that's basically what the Phillips curve shows us, but in a very different way. So, when it comes to an exam, it's unlikely you're going to get a very specific question on the Phillips curve. You might do, but unlikely. Uh, chances are you can use the Phillips curve to show what you already know, demand pull, cost push inflation, and long-term equilibrium according to the classical model. So bear that in mind. Uh, it's also very useful to show the conflict between inflation and unemployment. So anytime you're making that point in an essay, you can bring in the Phillips curve to uh, substantiate your point and to add weight to your point. But it doesn't really tell us anything new, so bear that in mind as we go through this theory. Okay, so the Phillips curve. We're going to look at the short-run Phillips curve. Uh, Phillips was a New Zealand economist uh, who kind of made his name when working for the London School of Economics, and he came out with this theory in the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, mapping the relationship between wages and unemployment. And he just did a very simple uh, correlation analysis, uh, looking at data going back over 100 years or so, to look at what was going on between wage growth and unemployment in the economy. And he came up with this relationship when plotting lots of points and using the line of best fit, he came up with this curve, a downward sloping curve to make reference to the inverse relationship between wage growth and unemployment. And he said, well, in times of very low unemployment down here, wages were rising very quickly. Uh, and that makes sense because when unemployment is low, workers are scarce, they have more bargaining power to push up wages. That's a natural uh, uh, relationship we'd expect there. Whereas in times of high unemployment, it makes sense that wages or wage growth would be falling and even maybe becoming negative as workers took pay cuts uh, during times of high unemployment when uh, workers were plentiful in supply, putting downward pressure on wages. So he came up with this relationship, which makes a lot of sense, but economists actually took that one stage further. Instead of looking at wage growth on the um, y-axis, we can actually put inflation rate instead, and that's uh, in percent, of course. And uh, economists said, well, it's, it's fair enough for us to change uh, wage growth to inflation rate, because in the 1960s, when this uh, theory came about, when this model came about, firms were very labour intensive. So if there were changes in wages, it was likely that that would feed directly through to changes in the inflation rate. So if wage growth was increasing quite quickly, chances were that inflation would increase very quickly at the same time. So it was... Uh, uh, it was not too assumption based to change wage growth to inflation rate. Um, and this is something we should be aware of already. Now you know that during times of low unemployment, when the economy is close to full employment and AD keeps shifting to the right to get us there, you know that a side effect of an increase in growth and a reduction in unemployment is higher inflation, high demand for inflation. You would have studied that and learned that on a diagram. The Phillips curve tells us exactly the same thing. What it tells us is that there is a conflict between unemployment and inflation, and this is a big problem for policymakers. And you can see why politicians didn't like what the Phillips curve was saying. So SRPC here stands for short run Phillips curve, and it shows that if you want to have low unemployment, so down here, low unemployment, you have to sacrifice your inflation objective. You can't have low and stable inflation at the same time, you're going to suffer from high rates of inflation. Hmm, problem, conflict. Whereas, if you want to have low levels of inflation, low and stable inflation rates, you have to sacrifice your unemployment target. You must, as a politician, sacrifice unemployment and, and deal with high unemployment, unfortunately. That's the conflict that the short-run Phillips curve is, is saying here. And that conflict can be derived from what's happening to aggregate demand. So, a lot of the Phillips curve uh, theory stems from what classical uh, economics tells us, classical aggregate demand and aggregate supply models tell us. If you're not sure about the classical model, watch my very detailed video on that um, to understand it. Let's show the classical model here to understand this conflict. So we'll take price level and real GDP. Let's take an economy that is at the full employment level of output. We've 
the price level of P1. On our Phillips curve, let's map that across. So on our Phillips curve, that point there, let's put an actual inflation number. That could well be 2% unemployment. And if we keep going across, that takes us to point A, which let's say represents 5% unemployment, which is the natural rate of unemployment. Mm -hmm. So remember, at full employment, that doesn't mean that unemployment is zero. It means there is still some structural unemployment, frictional seasonal unemployment. There is still going to be some unemployment there. So the natural rate represents the unemployment level when the labor market is at, is at equilibrium. And the only uh, unemployment that can exist there is supply side, is uh, structural seasonal frictional. So 5% unemployment, and with that you have a low and stable rate of inflation, let's say 2%. Right, okay. What the Phillips curve says is that let's say we want to increase uh, growth and reduce unemployment. Well, we're going to suffer from higher inflation at the same time, and that can be shown here by shifting AD to the right. So let's say we shift AD from AD1 to AD2. In the short term, in the classical model, that increases growth and that will reduce unemployment below the natural rate, but at a cost of higher inflation. And if we go to our Phillips curve, that's exactly what's being shown here. So we move to point B, and point B will represent higher inflation, maybe that's now 3%, and lower unemployment, below the natural rate, maybe a 4%. So yes, you benefit from lower unemployment, this growth increases in the short term, but you have to suffer from higher rates of inflation beyond your target rate. So on the Phillips curve, when AD shifts to the right, we move up the Phillips curve. Let's say AD shifts to the left from AD1 to AD3. In a classical model, output falls to Y3 and inflation falls to P3. So when it comes to unemployment, we know unemployment will rise beyond the natural rate. So again, we map that point across, maybe that's inflation falling to 1% here, but if we keep going across, we end up at point C, and we can see here, that unemployment is increasing, maybe to 7%. So there's the conflict right there. You're seeing a benefit in terms of lower inflation, but you're suffering from higher unemployment at the same time. And that's the basic conflict we're used to when aggregate demand shifts left and right. So what to take away from here? Well, uh, Whenever aggregate demand shifts, right or left, there is a movement along the Phillips curve. If aggregate demand shifts to the right, we move up the Phillips curve, representing higher inflation, lower unemployment. Whereas if aggregate demand shifts to the left, we move down the Phillips curve, from A to C in this diagram, to represent higher unemployment but lower inflation. So whenever AD shifts, we move along the short-run Phillips curve. That's the key thing to take away. So in that sense, we can use the short-run Phillips curve to represent demand and inflation too, and how demand and inflation can increase and decrease according to shifts of AD, uh, as has been shown here. So, useful to show the conflict between inflation and unemployment, yes, but also to show demand for inflation, according to AD changing. Now, that was the basic idea of Phillips. That's why he kind of stopped in his uh, theoretical understanding. However, monetarists, classical economists, like uh, Milton Friedman, decided that that basic model was not good enough. It didn't actually tell us uh, and explain periods where an economy can be suffering from high inflation and high unemployment, known as stagflation. Where could that be shown on the Phillips curve? Nowhere. So therefore, the Phillips curve was adapted in the short run to also shift. Right, at the moment, the problem with this Phillips curve is that it doesn't explain how we can have periods of stagflation, where uh, unemployment can be very high, so over here somewhere, and inflation at the same time can be very high. It doesn't explain that at all. Right? According to the Phillips curve, you can either only have low unemployment with high inflation or low inflation with high unemployment. Where is high unemployment and high inflation? Well, classical economists have changed, adapted the model to actually account for periods of stagflation. And they said, well, let's take a negative supply side shock, which could shift SRAS to the left, from SRAS1 to SRAS2. Well, as can be shown, there's the increase in inflation and there's the increase in unemployment at the same time as output falls from YV to Y2. Now, if we go across to our Phillips curve, there's point A, we started at point A, take the same figures, 2% inflation, and the natural rate of unemployment, call it 5%. Um, going across and going up our Phillips curve, yes, we can show the higher inflation that's being caused by this negative supply side shock. Maybe that's an increase in oil prices, an increase in uh, a sudden increase in wages maybe, uh, maybe it's a sudden increase in import prices, whatever it might have done, a shock to the economy that increases, uh, that shifts SRAS from SRA1 to SRAS2 and increases inflation. 
Yes, that's being shown on the, on the diagram here, but apparently unemployment will fall, and that's not what's being shown on this diagram here. So monetarists said, no, when SRAS shifts, when there is a negative supply side shock, the Phillips scope will shift. And it shifts the opposite way to the shift of SRAS. So from SRPC1 to SRPC2. And now, if we move across, you will see that the economy moves to point B, which represents a higher rate of inflation, I don't call it 3%, but also a higher rate of unemployment, more than the natural rate of, let's say, 6% here. Okay, so the economy moves from point A to point B, shifts to a new short run Phillips curve. What about a positive supply side shock? Maybe that's a fall in the oil price. Well, in the classical model, that will increase output to Y2 in the short run and reduce cost push inflation to P2. Again, if we go across to our Phillips curve, that won't be being shown on SLPC1 at all. SLPC1 will tell us, yeah, as you move down it, fair enough, there is a reduction in inflation, but apparently there is going to be an increase in unemployment. That's not what's being shown on this diagram. So, we shift the short run Phillips curve, but this time to the left, to SLPC3. And what we see here is if we move across on this new Phillips curve, yeah, there might be lower inflation at point C, but there is a reduction in unemployment as well, below the natural rate of unemployment at 4%, which is exactly what's being shown here. So the key thing to take away is that through the adaptation of the short run Phillips curve by monetarists, stagflation can be shown here. When a supply side shock takes place, the short run Phillips curve shifts in the opposite direction to which the short run aggregate supply curve shifts. So if SRAS shifts to the left, a negative supply side shock, the SRPC will shift to the right. And that's how we can show stagflation. So point B here represents stagflation, overcoming a major limitation of the basic short run Phillips curve uh, done on the previous diagram. Now stagflation can be shown as well, which represents periods of higher inflation and higher levels of unemployment. So we can also show cost push inflation using the short run Phillips curve uh, by shifting it left or right according to changes in cost of production when SRES changes. All right, so in this video we've shown how we can use the Phillips curve in three different ways. To show demand pull inflation, moving up or down the Phillips curve, showing cost push inflation, shifting the Phillips curve left and right, and to show the basic conflict between inflation and unemployment when aggregate demand changes in the economy. Now, monetary is still fundamentally uh, disagreed with this uh, model or found major limitations with this model, even as it stands right now, because it doesn't actually show long-term equilibrium. The classical model will actually um, show how the economy can move back to full employment levels of output in the long term. No such uh, indication is being shown on this short run Phillips curve. That uh, understanding is not being shown, hence it's limited. So the monetarists adapted this model further, and in my next video I'll show how the long run Phillips curve can be derived. Until then, see you, see you later.